So I'll give a little bit of a background on soil health in North Dakota. It's pretty typical that if I, if I go somewhere to talk about soil health, I usually have pictures of the farmers I work with because those are the ones that we're learning alongside. Um, I think it would be foolish to say that we're, that we're leading these efforts as a university or foolish to say we're leading it just as farmers or as research institutes or as the NRCS, but to think about it as a partnership and how we're learning alongside, alongside each other to make these systems work in our climate. So, um, so it is a journey. This is a, the Soil Sense podcast that we have out, uh, hosted by Tim Hammerich, who hosts the Future of Ag podcast as well, um, where he talks about that soil health is a journey. So it's not a prescription. It's, it's not anything that you can prescribe to somebody to do. It's a journey that they go through on their farms. It's a journey that I go through as an extension person. It's a journey that people go through as researchers to look at, at Collaboration, curiosity, communication is really critical amongst all these different groups of farmers, researchers, consultants, extension. So really all of us working together, I think, is one of the very unique parts of what we have in North Dakota, um, but also something that we really need to keep our eye on the prize with that and keep using those partnerships to move forward. Um, so who's involved in Soil Health at NDSU? I kind of want to show you all the different people. So we had this Soil Health Initiative, which was really fantastic in 2012, creating six positions at NDSU, mine being one of them. Um, but we also have all these other individuals at, at, at NDSU, both on main campus, but then also at the RECs who are working on soil health. Um, so here's the main, the six people that were hired, or the six of us here. So I run the extension for the state. Kaylee Gash runs the research. Uh, Naeem Kalwar and Langdon and Chris Augustine and Minot. Uh, both are extension. And then Jasper Tebow and Van Gomont over in Hedinger and Jasper's in Carrington. They run the research. And then we have all these other individuals who are working on main campus, like Maris Alberti and Ryan Beto over in Dickinson. Everybody is working on something related to soil health, whether it's cover crops, reducing tillage, intercropping, uh, cereal rye varieties, and developing those so we have specific varieties that can fit the needs of our, of our state. Um, everybody is working on this. Then you throw in this really valuable partnership with Burley County and the Minokan Farm and the NRCS here at the state level. And then you, you have another powerful partnership here where we can cover a lot of ground in the east, we can cover a lot of ground central, and then you have the Mandak Zero Till Association, which has brought in a lot of information, a lot of partnerships, and a lot of um, on-farm applications that I would say serve the whole state, but primarily the western part of the state. So I think we're doing a really good job with all of our partnerships covering a lot of ground and getting a lot of soil health practices out there. Uh, but we know that on-farm work is where, where it happens, right? We know that our research extension centers and the things we do in our research areas, like Mark talked about the challenges of the, the space that it takes to do some of these studies. We know that a lot of it happens on farm. And so doing studies on farm and working with farmers to get those studies done, uh, developing those relationships has been really, really important. And that's something Dave Franzen at NDSU has, has focused on quite a bit. Uh, but we also know that there needs to be trust, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing if I go out and say, okay, you know what, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I'm gonna give you all this advice on how you should farm. Well, nobody's gonna trust me unless I come in and they get to know me first. They get to understand that my heart is in the right place, that I really want to help and I wanna learn alongside other people. And then that trust is what takes us forward. So Lee Breeze here is a, an outstanding crop consultant that we have in Edgeley. He builds his relationships on trust and his, and his um, advice that he get, provides to farmers. And then I think that there's something that happens when we create a network. And I think um, when we talk about this network of farmers relying on farmers and whether you're 20 miles away, it's your neighbor, or you're 200 miles away, or you're a state away, or whatever it might be, that that network can be really, really valuable. And that's where I come in, and that's what I try to focus on to build for our, for our region. And we've done it really, really successfully. So if you want to talk about network approaches to extension, this is it. Um, well, this is one version of it. We have another one that we're developing. But um, on this diagram, we have all these locations where we have these cafe talks. So if you haven't heard about the cafe talks, it's basically getting groups of people that are interested in soil health together at one place to grab lunch and talk through ideas. So we're taking an old idea of the cafe and we're reinventing it to be focused on soil health. And if you look at, so these are all the locations in blue. And then if you look at these dots, these are all individuals. Okay, so the green are NDSU, the red are consultants, uh, the blue are farmers, the yellow are I think NRCS and other educators, the orange are industry, um, and the gray means I couldn't figure out what they did. Most of these people in this network I know, but the gray ones I don't. Um, so this is, 
the, the, how you look at this and understand this is that as you move to the center of the diagram, the size of the dot is important and also the location is. So the further you are to the center and the, and the larger the dot, the more integral you are in that network, the more of a, of a communicator or a person you are sharing information in here. So since I can't tell you who these other people are, even though I know who they are, I can tell you this is me, the center of the universe, right here. <laughs> And it's only because I've been to every single cafe talk and because I design them and because I, I, I know everybody in the network. But um, if you look at here, oops, if you look at here, we've got some consultants that are here that are advising on a lot of acres that are part of this network and they're in, towards the center. We have several farmers of different ages. Some of these farmers are, are early 20s and some of them are in their 60s that are helping to guide information and share information on what they're doing and how that's transferring across farms. And so our goal over, the, over time is that all these people will get tighter in here. We'll bring all these people who have just started to be part of the network, we bring them to the inside, and we get more people on the outside and keep bringing them in, keep bringing them in. And the whole goal of this is that if one person leaves the network, and I'm not leaving, Greg, don't worry. <laughs> if one person leaves the network or kicks the bucket or whatever happens, that this network will continue and it's something that can last a very long time. And that's what's really important about it, is that it can, it can, it's bigger than the individual, it's about the, the people involved in it in the network. Um, so we've done some evaluations of, these, of the Cafe Talk program, and I wanna make sure I don't go over my time, because I don't wanna cut into Tony or Morgan's time. Um, but here's, here's some evaluation results from the Cafe Talk program. So these are just people who responded to this evaluation that we sent out. They've attended a Cafe Talk, they did a pretty lengthy evaluation to give us a lot of great information. Um, and we did this in 2016, and we did it again in 2019. And so the total acres farmed, you can see at first we didn't have many respondents, but 52,000 acres is kind of what we were looking at impacting. Um, and then when we, inc when we did it again in 2019, we had quite a few uh, more respondents and we're now reaching 157,000 acres. Um, most of them lease their land, which I think when we talk about soil health, do you do these practices on land you own or land you lease? Uh, we're finding that a lot of farmers are doing this on land that they lease, which is interesting, right? Uh, we're also finding that, that it's being done on acres owned, farm without livestock, farm with livestock. Um, you can see kind of how that breakdown is for the acres, for the respondents of the valuation. But if we look at farmer adoption of, of practices, and so I'm gonna apologize, this is really hot off the press and I, and I screwed up on these titles over here, but I'll just tell you what they are. Uh, this bottom green bar is that they're using this practice as a result of attending a cafe talk. Okay, so we're seeing some adoption, right, of different practices, where we really focus on these black bars where they're considering adopting a practice as a result of attending a cafe talk. And so this is where I look at this 33% and I say, wow, if 33% of the farmers are interested in adopting a practice, maybe we ought to talk about that a little more. Maybe we should have some more strip till, till, till trials. But then you also look up here and you say 47% are like, oh, I'm not even gonna consider this, forget it. It's not gonna be in my wheelhouse or my toolbox. So then you kind of make the decision, okay, maybe this is regional. Maybe some areas we're looking at strip-till, some areas we're just not gonna bother looking at it. We can pull that out of the data set eventually. Um, <clears throat> but we can see that a lot of people were reducing fall tillage prior to attending the cafe talks. And, and keep in mind, this is a specific group of people interested in extension events, interested in soil health. So a lot of these practices are gonna be already adopted. Um, but we can kind of look at this and decide where we can focus our efforts on tillage practices based on farmer responses and how they're adopting them. But we can also look at what consultants are recommending, right? They cover a lot of acres, they have a lot of information that they're sharing and advising with 30 or so growers that they may work with. And so here we have the tillage practices again, and they're in a different order because we did it ranked by, by how much they're adopting it, adopting, recommending that practice and reducing fall tillage is something that they're, that they're highly recommending to farmers um, for a soil health practice. And I think that's important to see that. Uh, but we can also look at what are they considering and reducing spring tillage is the next area that they may talk about or where they're going to focus their efforts to get farmers to reduce spring tillage. And so this is really valuable information to know. We can understand now what's going to be recommended by consultants who are covering thousands of acres. Um, adoption of cover crop practices. So, and I know there's feedback from that speaker. Uh, if we look here, we've got established a cover crop and standing soybean. 51% of people are considering that, of respondents are considering that. So we've got to figure out how to fly on cover crops into soybean and make it work. We've got to figure out how to intercede. We've got to figure out some way to get those cover crops established. And likely that solution is going to come from a partnership between somebody that's doing some of the research and a farmer who's got the mechanics to figure out how to do it, right? I mean, farmers know their equipment. There's no way I'm going to tell them how to do something with equipment because they know I barely know the difference between a tractor and a combine. So I was told the first time I was in a, in a combine. <laughs> and I said I was in a tractor. 
I did not grow up on a farm though, right? This is, these are things that I need to learn along the way. Um, but here we've got diversifying rotation. So that's promising to me. We know a lot of our issues we can control with crop rotation alone, weed pressures, disease pressures. And if they were doing it to include cover crops, that's a great way to add in diversity. Um, Multi-species cover crop mixes and cover crop and standing corn. So there's that interseeding. So Mark, if you were looking for validation on that interseeding study, there you have it. That's a good, good direction to go. Um, so then consultant recommendation of practices. Again, let's look at establishing a standing, a, a cover crop and standing corn that's being uh, recommended as a result of, of learning some of the tools through the conversations. Um, diversifying crop rotation, using cereal rye as a cover crop. That's such a great gateway tool for us to get from, to reduce tillage systems. And um, it seems it's a very easy cover crop to use. But then we can look at here, multi-species mix, they're considering recommending it. And so we have to figure out what, you know, maybe what is it that pushes them over to recommending that? Or what, what is the barrier here? And I think we can pull that from our data set when we analyze it further. Um, the other thing we've been doing, so we've been evaluating these cafe talks and, and really finding out what farmers are trying and doing and adopting. Um, but we also have the Soil Suds podcast, where we had the first 16 episodes came out in August. Um, since then, we've had over 13,000 plays, now that I checked this morning, and so that's huge. Um, from what I hear, that's really good. I'm no podcast expert, but I hear that that's a really good response to it, so we're releasing the second series on Monday. And these are where all the people are listening to what we're doing in North Dakota and the partnerships we have, and I think that's really, really cool to see our reach beyond our state boundaries um, into the world and seeing that people care about what we're doing. And sometimes when you're using soil health practices, all you need to know is that somebody cares about what you're doing and that it means something to somebody else too. Um, and that can give you kind of the strength to move forward and continue on. Um, but every situation is unique. And this is Joe Brecker. I think we saw a picture of his field in Rutland before um, in the first presentation is that every situation is unique. But farmers that are using these practices thoroughly believe that there's an opportunity to move towards a conservation practice on every farm. You just have to figure out what works for you. And that's what's so difficult about soil health is that it's highly specified. It really is goal specific to each farmer, to their soil type, to their equipment, to their rotation, to every single thing about it. And then it's, and then it's subject to the growing season conditions. I mean, look at this year that we had. It was, it was really, really challenging. Um, but it, it's how it works for them. And I keep that in my mind all the time when I'm thinking about, can I make a broad recommendation I probably never will be able to make a broad recommendation, but I can find out what works for farmers on their farms and their specific fields, and we can listen and we can find those solutions together. Um, so here's, here's all my information. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty accessible here. Twitter, Instagram, cell phone. I totally gave up an office phone because I realize I'm in my office like three days a year. So I have a cell phone. Um, and also, there, here's the link for the Soil Sense podcast, ndsoilsense.com. And then we have a, a workshop in December that I really, really like that's all about networking called the Dirt Workshop. So you can check that out too. But I want to turn it over now. Tony's going to come up. He's a farmer that I've worked with. Well, thank you, Abby. Um, as Abby said, I'm uh, from the Jamestown area, which if nobody knows where Jamestown is, it's between here and Fargo. And if you don't know where that is, well, welcome to North Dakota. <laughs> so I've realized that there is a huge difference between the eastern part of the state and the western part of the state. So the things that I'm doing is kind of tailored to, to what works uh, on my farm. I'm not reinventing uh, uh, no-till and cover crops and such. This is just something that I've started in my area because where we're at, it's literally a corn and bean alternation, not a rotation. I don't know how you can have a rotation with two things, but whatever. So I've been uh, no-till for about 20 years now. Uh, I've been messing around with cover crops for about 12. And yeah, we've got a range of uh, very sandy soils to, to very heavy clay soils. You wouldn't think Jamestown would have sandy soils, but it actually does. And they say, what do you consider sandy soil? And I say, well, if you put a probe in the ground, you pull the probe out, and half of it runs out the bottom, I'd say that's pretty sandy. So I run uh, on my sandy ground and on my clay soils. Uh, I've got peas, wheat, oats, flax, soybeans, corn, cereal rye, barley. Uh, th this is not normal for the Jamestown area. And uh, so I've, I've tailored a, a lot of these crops for the certain soil types. So uh, this field in particular is uh, one of our very sandy ones that we have. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll run a, a short season crop that's usually harvested around July, August. And then uh, immediately, like sometimes the, well, if we can, I mean, there's, I, I run a really small ship of people. So uh, sometimes, yeah, there's three of us. So, so a lot of times, if we could try to keep the drill in the field as we're going along, that's, uh, 
Uh, that's what we'll try to do. But I, I immediately try to put a cover crop in. And like on these particular sandy soils, I want something that dies off in the wintertime. I do not want anything growing in the springtime just to be able to, for us to conserve moisture on these types of soils. So then I found out that uh, with wheat in our rotation that I have an issue with stubble and uh, uh, trying to get a cover crop in there and such, it, it, was, it was such a disaster. We'd try to run a harrow across it or something like that to try to spread out the residue and all we had was just a bunch of muskrat houses everywhere. So I thought, well, what, what's the best way to, to handle my residue? Well, let's leave it where it was. So I invested in a uh, stripper header, uh, be about five seasons ago. And uh, I really, I think there's maybe one other person around the Jamestown area that has one. It has been absolutely fantastic, but there's only certain crops that you can harvest with it. So this picture here was my aha, ta-da, that's what I've been waiting for. So apparently you can see there's a difference uh, on the left. There's a very dark soil and on the right there is, it looks like it's kind of washed out. So I had been working with this soil for years and it eventually got to the point where I'm going, I don't know if I'm seeing any results with anything. We've been constantly cover cropping and no-tilling. And when you're kind of the only one in the area doing it, you kind of wonder, you know, you're going down this path and there's nobody following you. And eventually he starts slowing down going, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be going this way. <laughs> so anyway, so we purchased some property that is literally across the fence, on the same section, across the fence. The picture on the right has never had any no-till ever done to it. So we went out, what, Abby, these are samples done within five minutes of each other? And that's the difference that we found between the two. And then I went, ta-da, it's working. <laughs> so I just think this is a fantastic picture. It gets me pretty giddy. So on our heavier soils now, I'll run uh, our stripper head across it. And then uh, what's nice is that stubble is all still upstanding. So then when we come in and uh, seed our cover crop into it, uh, it, it looks like a disaster. But when you actually walk out in there and you separate the residue, just I, I'll, it's all I'll need high to waste high, and the soil's all exposed. So when you actually go in and seed into it, the seed to soil contact is absolutely fantastic. So what we'll do with our heavier soils is now I'll put in rye on this type of soil just to be able to start using up some moisture because there usually is a moisture problem and it is unreal how they're I've dealt with rye for quite a few years and I found out that there is a, a love-hate relationship with it. But once you figure out how the beast reacts to certain things, you actually can kind of pull it back and you can actually work very, very well together with it. But I, my uh, cover crops that I usually do, I don't get wild on it. Uh, just three years ago, I got really crazy and actually put in a four-way mix most of the time I run a three-way mix because uh, I've, the way I kind of look at it is your soil is a house and your house only has so much room and the more you have inside of it, the more they actually don't work very well together and people get angry and they all just kind of segregate each other. So I found that you can have just as much fun with three to four people and keep your costs down. Th that's what I've done. Like I said, this is what I've learned on, uh, on our operation. So, And uh, this is a, a picture of uh, just some cereal rye that we're planting into in the springtime. As you can see, it's raining. I have no idea how much rain we got here, but it kept working because we had an issue with moisture. So I didn't desiccate it at all. This is some pretty heavy ground. And on this one, this literally, this picture was probably a couple days difference. This is light soil. It actually looks like a field in September. This is actually probably the middle of May. So we just went in, desiccated the rye because we knew we were gonna have a moisture issue. Went and uh, planted right into it and it worked out fantastic. And this is what it kind of looks like afterwards. Uh, this is on wheat stubble that was stripped. And this particular field here I don't think we even put any, uh, these are soybeans that are growing into it, put in with a 22 inch planter. We didn't do any pre-emergence. Uh, I pretty much 
sprayed it with Roundup, and I maybe sprayed it again uh, in season, and, and that was about it. I believe these are some extend beans, but the control that I got off the rye is ridiculous. I just, here's my fancy notes. This is what I've got to work with here. So it looks like a bunch of chicken scratch, but my rye, I've got $2.53 into that chemical control right there. And you cannot find any chemical that will come close to that type of control. Plus holding your moisture and such, it, it just, it works, works great. So like I said before, this is what I do on my farm. We're only 100 miles east of here. It's a totally different terrain. Uh, you get, uh, I've got a friend of mine that farms in, in Elgin. Obviously that's a, a totally different world. Morgan, you're from a totally different world from where I'm from. But uh, I can let you know just what we got here in the past year for moisture. So in five months from 2019, we got 20.37 inches. And so far, as of October 11th, we're sitting at 61 inches of snow. So when I got over to Bismarck, you guys have no snow <laughs> at all. Uh, there's guys in our area that are still trying to harvest corn. Uh, we're still trying to do corn. Our biggest problem right now is mud. You wouldn't think so, but underneath all this snow, it is so muddy that uh, we were combining three days ago. We got a uh, combine and a cart stuck in mud on a side hill. So... Uh, Fortunately, in 2019, I kind of forget what year it is because we're still combining. Was it 2020 now? Yes. So in 2019, we put rye on just about 100% of our ground because we were so wet. Uh, most of our harvest is a month and a half behind. My peas usually get harvested middle of July. I didn't get those off till September. Our spring wheat usually gets done in uh, first uh, middle of August, that was September when we got done with that. Uh, cover crops did not work out very well, but we put rye on everything, and we're hoping that this will get us through 2020 to actually be able to get a crop put in. So I think Tony and I are just going to hang out on the stage to avoid tripping down the stairs, at least in my case. But, uh, but Morgan Jacobs, I have not worked with Morgan yet, but I'm excited because I've seen a lot of what he's been doing on Twitter, and I've heard a lot from like Lana Shaw up in Saskatchewan about your intercropping and um, so it was great that Daryl asked Morgan to be on this panel as well, because you are from, I don't know what town, but you're northwest. What town? Noonan. Noonan? Yeah. Okay, Noonan, North Dakota. Have not been there, sorry. <laughs> but I'll turn it over to Morgan. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking me to come out. I'm excited to be part of this uh, uh, farmer panel here today. Um, <clears throat> so like, she, like Abby said, um, uh, farm way up in the northwest corner of the state, up at Noonan. Um, if you get to the end of the world and just keep going just a little further, you'll run into our place. Um, my brother and I um, run Rocking Jay Grain and Cattle, um, and then we just recently um, started Northern Prairie Market LLC. That's where we direct market um, beef, pork, chicken, um, and we're working to expand um, into that as well. Um, when I talk about uh, what we do on our farm, um, diversity, you'll hear that word over and over and over again. Um, that's because... Um, it allows us to do so many, so many things. We're not stuck um, with all of our eggs in one basket. Um, on any typical year, we'll grow eight to 10 crops. Um, in 2019, we grew 12. Um, they're everything from legumes, oil seeds, cereals, both warm and cool season. Um, we already talked about all the animals that run around the farm and we direct market those directly to consumers on the Northwest corner of the state at the moment. Um, I just put on these uh, custom uh, operations that that we do on the farm as well because that adds to the to the diversity and also um, gives us an advantage when we talk about intercropping uh, here in a couple minutes. Um, so just to give you an idea of what drives our decision making on the farm, the first and foremost is the five soil health principles that I think everybody in the room are familiar with. The other thing is um, is this graph here. We saw Tom had shown a graph similar to this. I took this one from uh, Steve Kenyon and Greener Pastures Ranching. You can see that there's no lack of money in agriculture these days. Uh, what's concerning to me is the uh, farmer's share of that money that's in agriculture. So we're always, every day we're trying to figure out how we can keep more money in our pocket on the farm instead of sending that out of, um, out of our hands um, and down the road. In case you don't know where Noonan is, um, here, here's where we're at. You can't get any further north in North Dakota. Uh, the farm's a half mile from Canada. So that gives us, that provides a couple things to us. First, it actually maybe allows us more opportunities. There's a lot of 
a lot of markets in Canada that we can access to grow different crops than say somebody that's located in the southeast corner of the state. They're more limited in the markets they have to access to sell crops. But this also shortens our growing season that far north. It makes it a challenge to get a cover crop in after a, after a, a cash grain crop in many cases. So we're looking at ways to, to be able to get that diversity in the fields um, every year um, when sometimes a cover crop after your um, cash grain harvest isn't really an option. So a crop rotation, uh, we don't really have a set crop rotation on our farm. Um, like I said, when there's 8 to 12 crops, it allows us a lot of opportunity to, to move crops here and there. We do have a few, um, a few rules or guidelines that we try to follow um, when selecting which crop to grow next on a certain field uh, or which ones to avoid, but that can all change year to year. Um, and then I thought about, I should put something in here about um, what kind of tillage goes on on our farm. Uh, Dad bought his first John Deere no-till drill in 2004. Um, since then, it's been a pretty rapid sell-off of tillage equipment on the farm. So I went around the farm and tried to find all the tillage equipment we owned. Um, and this is what I came up with. Um, so we farm inside the red box. Um, everything we farm is within the red box there. Where the green line is, that's uh, north and east of there. The land is, is pretty dang flat. Um, if you get south and west of there, you get into rolling hills. Um, we have really heavy clay soils on almost all of our farm ground. We do have a few sandy soils, but most of those are in perennial pastures uh, that we just graze. So with, uh, and it's a lot of zero to 6% slopes on, on the land, so uh, drainage and um, water can be an issue. Lots of times if you get a big heavy rain, um, the water really takes up, you know, it can eat up a lot of acres in a hurry. So then we'll, one of the things that we've really been um, working with in the last uh, two or three years is intercropping. Intercropping is um, a way to get diversity in a field. Um, it allows us to grow a brassica, you see here canola, and mitigate some of the soil health um, risks or, or um, detriments of growing a brassica. We're able to limit some of those, um, those soil health issues maybe by adding another crop to it and still keeping, um, keeping canola in the rotation. Um, intercropping, I wouldn't, wouldn't um, advise growing two crops in one field and shortening your rotation. Say you had wheat, canolas, and peas in your rotation, and pretty soon now you have a wheat, peola, wheat, peola oscillation. Um, but it allows us to sometimes grow a crop. Like we, we're not in a traditional chickpea growing area, um, but we have grown chickpeas the last two years um, because of intercropping. One of the things, um, you get a lot of questions when you uh, hear about intercropping. And honestly, the first time I heard about intercropping, I said, who in the heck would ever do that? That sounds like a lot of work, a lot more management. Um, there can be a lot of issues, um, but they're not, once you start working with them, a lot of the issues that you think you'd run into, they're really not that hard to. Um, tweak um, management here or there. Uh, just another picture. This is a 2018 picture. Pretty, pretty good success with chickpeas and flax. And when I talk about uh, trying to figure out how to keep more pocket or more money in the farmer's pocket, um, this is one way that we can really increase net profit on our farm. Um, one of the issues, the biggest drawbacks to intercropping is you cannot currently get federal crop insurance, so there's a lot more risk. And a young guy like me that walks into my banker and tells him I can't get crop insurance, he kind of, I mean, it's not a smile on his face. So uh, that kind of limits our, limits how many acres we can do. Um, but it really does, when it, when it works and you're able to reduce fungicide applications in this case, uh, it really does add, uh, keep more money in your pocket. So I, this is 2018. 2019, we had chickpeas that looked like this. The chickpeas were not... Um, they weren't mature but by the time it started raining in September. By the time we got them harvested, they looked no more than like chicken feed or cow feed. So it's not a, it's not a silver bullet. A couple of other things. I was telling Abby earlier today that I was really bad at taking pictures in 2019. These are a couple of the pictures from 2019. In the picture on the left, um, that's faba beans in corn. Um, remember this picture when I talk about a couple of soil tests here in just a second. Um, this field is right north of our farm. Um, one of the fields that we farm that's furthest down the soil health pathway. And that's, um, I'm pretty embarrassed to say that when you can see all this brown soil, but um, I'll talk about that here in a second. This other field is chickpeas and flax on an expired CRP field. Uh, this is one of my favorite weeds, alfalfa. And here is some recycled, um, recycled 
uh, dry matter there. Bale grazing, um, one of the things that uh, I really like, um, if, if you're like me and you like instant gratification, bale grazing, you can see positive results from bale grazing in a couple of weeks. Um, in the fall of 2018, we put, um, we set out bales on this salt flat of a pasture that we have. If you remember back to the topography slide, the hills south of Noonan, um, they drain through these pastures up through into Canada. They bring with them a lot of, um, a lot of runoff. And over the last 20, 25 years, we've really ended up with a lot of salt spots in the fields. Um, just in one year, you can see um, this, salt, this salt line used to run all the way along the ditch, and it actually continues off this way. We put a couple of bales out there just to see what it would do. Um, and in one year, you can see, uh, my guess is that we stopped evaporation, and we were able to start growing green grass. It doesn't show up real well here, but these are green bale circles here with all the rest of it's dried up. This is after a f uh, fr uh, frost. Uh, we've been seeing results like this across, across um, all of our bale grazing it, uh, spots, so that's something we're really um, excited about. We also uh, do a lot of grazing of full season cover crops. We've started calving in May and June. Um, the calves stay on the, on the farm a lot longer. That gives us options of moving around yearlings instead of cows with calves and having to sort and make sure we end up with calves in the right pasture with the right cow. And it's a lot easier to move those around. There's uh, many benefits that we've seen already in just a couple of years of really, really doing a lot of this. Um, nutrient cycling and soil armor are a couple of the biggest ones and uh, we've already seen an increase in uh, water holding capacity. Here's that soil test on that field. I showed you the faba bean and corn. Um, the year before we had grown a, a forage crop that we hate off in July, moved those bales across the fence line and bale grazed them. And then right after that, we seeded another uh, cover crop mix in, into that field. And then we grazed them in the fall. Well, I left the cows in there a week or two too long and they grazed off all of the above ground biomass and we ended up with that bare ground. And you can see that's the difference I think it's the difference between the uh, 2018 and the 2019 soil test where we, we actually used up a little bit of um, organic matter there. And then this is the field um, right behind the place. Um, this is an interesting one to me because you can see from 2014 until 2018, it was pretty much had flatlined. Um, this is the field I'd say is the furthest down the pathway. It's always been the guinea pig. We've tried all kinds of things on it. But after, after these soil tests were taken in 2018 through the winter, we fed on this field. And then we grew a full season cover crop in half of the field and a chickpea flax intercrop in the other half of the field. Um, soil tested across between feeding on it all winter long in that full season cover crop. Um, it was a composite test between the intercrop and the full season cover crop. So um, just to keep the soil test um, as a full field scale for year to year. But you can see we got um, quite a bump there. That might be a little bit skewed. I didn't do the soil sampling, but I don't know that you can bank on seeing that kind of increase in one year. Um, with that, um, looking forward to um, the uh, interactive part here, and you can see my contact information there. Okay, so this is great because we have tons of time for questions. Um, and that was our intention, was to make sure we have plenty of time to have a really good discussion. So, Daryl, you're running around with a microphone. Uh, for Tony, I missed, how did you kill the rye in that green planting that you did? I usually just go right in with uh, just Roundup and, and take care of it. And it, within probably seven days, is as yellow as what this table is. Have you ever considered uh, a crimping roller? Uh, I've kind of looked into them, but just uh, the way we run our operation, um, I... I need to be able to get over stuff fairly quick, so I just find that uh, spraying Roundup on it seems to work pretty well. And uh, when I usually desiccate it as early as what I do uh, and then plant into it, it's so small at that time that I'm not sure if a crimper roller would actually work very well unless it's fully up and, and headed. And I believe once you start fracturing those joints on it, I think it would actually probably work better. I'm from down south of the border of the state, but I'm wondering why you picked flax both as a cover crop and as an inner seed crop. Uh, this is a question for me, Kristen? Either, either one of you. Um, we, we like growing flax on our place. Um, I guess 
one of the the big benefits is it's uh, forms really good um, associations with mycorrhizal fungi colonies in the soil. Um, I get that's one of the that's one of the biggest reasons we put it in our cover crop mixes. Um, when we're in or when we're um, growing it with flax or with chickpeas, I mean, the idea there is that for whatever reason, I, I don't know the answer to why it is, but there seems to be um, a correlation between, uh, or it helps to reduce the, the, the ascochyta disease in the chickpeas for whatever reason, whether that's because it's holding up the leaves and allowing more air through it, or if it's just breaking up the movement of the disease across the field. But um, uh, Lana Shaw up in Saskatchewan, her and a couple of her um, colleagues have been working um, pretty, quite extensively on um, the effects of flax and chickpeas together on, on disease spread. Do you want to talk at all about your flax, Tony? Well, last year is the first year that I actually put it in with a crop and it was, um, I put it in with my field peas and the reason that I put it in with the field peas was to try to get it to stand up because every year it seems like our field peas will tip over. And just by harvesting the field, I've noticed that wherever there is any type of a, uh, a weed out there, that the field peas would crawl right up and it would stay up. So my intentions with what I thought was that it would hold it up. I wasn't sure how well it was gonna combine. I did it on a small acreage. I didn't put very many pounds down. I was anywhere from 12 to 20 pounds of flax seed per acre. I put it in at the same depth that my peas were. I didn't care if the flax made it or not because it's so small that it's bound to be on the top all the way down to where the depth of the peas were. I put everything in at two inches and it actually took really well and then it started to rain and then it kept raining and, and then it just kept raining. And then it, <laughs> it just, it started to fall over then. But it, it, we have some pictures that we've taken of it and it, it worked really well, but on a normal year, I, I don't know how well it would work, but I was very happy with the way it worked out. I have a question for Morgan. So, you know, there's a lot of people nowadays that don't want to mess with all the hassles of livestock, you know, year-round work, basically. And you've got all these different types of livestock. Do you have a bunch of people to help you manage them, or do you have a simple low-input ways to do it, reduces labor cost? You t and, you know, to talk a little, too, about the pros and maybe the cons of the livestock aspect of your operation. Um, so it's just, it's just me and my family. Uh, my brother and my dad, um, we've all, the three of us farm full time. So, um, and then we, always, we get help from my sisters, my wife, Isaac's wife. Um, um, but it's, I don't have enough money to go to Arizona in the wintertime. So I, I might as well do something, you know. Um, and it's really, diversification I think is, it's a big key to um, sustainability um, in agriculture. Um, cattle, it, for instance, say um, this, this year on that, we saw the picture of the corn and faba beans. When we put that in, um, we put that in with the idea that we weren't going to put apply any um, synthetic fertilizers. We were not going to um, apply any um, post-emergent herbicide. And we we're going to see how cheap we could grow corn in northwest North Dakota. Um, I, was, I was hoping for 60 bushels to the acre. Well, the timing of the rain and the dry spring, um, we, the weeds just, they took over. Um, so we, we didn't actually, there was nothing to combine. I mean, they adjusted it. It was not worth combining. But we have the livestock there. We have them available to us. Um, we already have the infrastructure to graze them there. We turned them out there. Um, and we, we made a profit on those acres that otherwise would have, without livestock, would have been a waste. Um, so I think they just... Uh, allow you a lot of opportunities to try things that you wouldn't um, have the ability to try if you, if you didn't have them around. Tony's got cows too. He didn't talk about them though. <laughs> no, I, I guess I run livestock. I just have 50 pair, but uh, I'll try to run them on our cover crop whenever I can. Uh, I mean, a good chunk of our stuff is somewhat fenced in, what, what we haven't ripped out, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I think it works fantastic. It, it definitely uh, relieves the pressure of, uh, of pastures. It's, it's absolutely unreal how 
just by a couple weeks of having some livestock grazing on some covers, uh, how it will really get the roots established on a, on a pasture, whether the year before it got grazed a little bit too hard. But uh, where I can get it to work out, I'll, I'll try to run my critters on, uh, we just have beef cows is all we have. So I'll try to run them on covers, but sometimes it just doesn't work. I have a question for Abby. Um, <laughs> you're not up Pass the Pass it off, okay. <laughs> you presented some really nice data on, um, you know, your cafe talks, and I've, I've actually been trying to get to one, I just haven't been able to make it. Um, what I, maybe I missed it. Um, you know, you, you showed uh, data on people adopting some of these practices or considering adopting some of those practices. Maybe what I missed is who's presenting and, and do you have metrics on, you know, is it you and, and uh, consultants and other researchers, your data that is, is convincing people or is it farmer testimonials? You know, what do you think is actually uh, moving the needle on this? That's a great question. Um, so the cafe talks, the, so when they started in 2014, I was fresh, brand new to North Dakota. Um, if you don't count the time I was doing my master's work here, but, but I had just moved here really, literally didn't know the difference between a combine and a tractor. And I knew I needed teachers, right? I knew I needed to talk with farmers to get that information and to understand the system better and to understand what farmers needed in this state versus coming in and assuming that I would know what they, what they needed us to work on. And so, um, so the Cafe Talks really started out as having no, no agenda, um, having no speakers, really. I mean, I say that I'll be there and, and I'll bring... I used to bring a colleague from campus as kind of a safety blanket, you know, because I was kind of scared to go out on my own, not having no ag background. Um, but now it's that my colleagues want to come with because they want to just share ideas and they want to share some of the findings that they're, that they're seeing in their research and get new ideas for research. Um, so I can't really, I don't know if I can say what's driving the changes, if it's the university information or it's the farmer sharing information or if it's the consultants providing perspective or or what it is, but I think there's, there's something that's happening amongst all the groups, um, which is why I, think, why I think all groups are so critical in, in the soil health process, that we all need to be sharing what we know. Um, you know, sometimes I think our, our job as the university is to, is, to, is, to, is to learn from farmers, but then provide some of the backup data that may be needed to help middle adopters make changes or to, to provide, you know, reduce the risk of adopting a practice. So. Um, so yeah, I don't know, it, it'd be interesting to find out what's driving that, but I think it really is all the groups together um, sharing that information that's, that's driving it. Because yeah, we don't, have, we don't have presentations, we don't have, I think I start the cafe talk for about 10 minutes and then I literally sit down and it's, it's like two hours of me taking a break. I mean, not really, I'm working still, but, um, but it's really just farmers sharing information and ideas and it's just, it's kind of a fun environment. I guess uh, I've got a question. Um, you guys had mentioned how you're able to uh, graze your livestock on that corn field and your cover crop fields. Uh, I was wondering if you guys notice a lot of ground compaction with that, and if so, what you guys do to uh, kind of combat that, I guess. Um, it is a it is a concern. Uh, you you have to. We always try to have an, an escape an escape route. If it rains for a couple of days, can we can we move them off the off the fields? Um, in the case that we can't, um, and it's in the fall, I'm not that concerned because we do have clays that expand. So I, I think that does take care of some of the compaction issues. Um, I guess short answer is I'm not as concerned about it as some people. Um, uh, we haven't seen big issues from it. Okay, I have a question. Tony, you talked about that you looked around and nobody was doing the same thing. How, in, when you bought the other, the farm adjacent or the land adjacent, that helped convince you? Is there other things that, as you were going in and deciding to do this, that helped you determine this is the direction I want to go? And, you know, are you starting to see some... Um, other people in your area doing the same thing? And then to Morgan, what made you guys make the step? And are you seeing your, re your neighbors and things start to take notice? How, how hard is it to be the leader there? And what are the issues that you have? And you know, what courage can you give to some of these other people to, to be leaders? I guess the, the whole reason I started off with it was uh, all of our very early crops that got harvested 
that uh, July, August timeframe is the ground was just idle for the rest of the season. And then uh, you usually just uh, possibly spray it just so to keep the weeds down and such. And, and then I noticed that uh, in the winter time that uh, like say a, a pea field, for example, would, if you don't get much snow cover, it would actually start blowing or all of a sudden you'd start to get these heavy rains that would come down. It seems like we can never get a gentle rain and it would wash in some spots. And uh, I've done all the spraying on our property since, uh, since I got out of college in 2003. So I literally go over every square foot of our property probably three times a year and I start to see some of the problems that I had. So I'd, uh, I've got a consultant that I've worked with uh, for years, uh, built a great relationship with him and would bounce ideas off of him. Well, you know, can, is there something that I could be doing because there really wasn't anybody else in the area. So uh, the whole reason, or the, how I started off was I wanted to see if I could double crop peas to see if they would actually come up, set pods on again, because I believe one year I got done harvesting field peas on the 10th of July. So I had all this time. I was like, well, I wonder if this is gonna work. And this, this is literally how it started. And planted it, never rained again. And the only spot that, it kind of grew maybe a few inches, but the low spots actually got up just about the height of this table, but that was only in the low spots they actually set pods on. So I just figured that that was a fail. But uh, uh, the next year, saw the results from it, just everything that we're doing on our farm, uh, I just see what's happening with the, uh, the different crops and the different uh, soils to work with and such. And, and from there, it's just, it's exploded. And I just kind of went on this trail really kind of by myself uh, and with my consultant and and then got introduced to Abby and uh, you would be surprised that uh, not very many people will do it. It's almost like they sit back, watch to wait for you to fail and they will not try it because they will come up with every excuse to that it will go wrong. So uh, we actually kind of uh, through Abby has built this network of, of other growers from around North Dakota and we get together and we share ideas and such. And I mean, it's kind of like a, a little support group, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the whole reason that, that I got onto the covers for it. So I'll pass it over to Morgan here. So I guess um, I, I was pretty lucky because um, my dad has always allowed us to try all these new things that a lot of people think are quite crazy. Um, and then the other thing that uh, kind of broke my way is I came to BSC and got brainwashed by some of the great folks that, um, that share, share experiences with the kids here. Um, so we, when I was here at BSC, we went all over the place. We weren't sitting in a classroom the whole time, which was really, I mean, it was amazing. We went all the way out to um, east of town, south of Mandan, west of town, north of Bismarck. We went everywhere and got to see all these different things that people were trying. And it just, when you're going to school and at that age, all of those ideas just started bouncing around in my head of what we could, what we could do. Um, and then another great thing that's happened, um, we have our own little support group up in Divide County. Um, we, there was a group of guys, um, actually Keith Brown and Dick Rowland a couple of winters ago put on a workshop and at the end of the workshop, they sent around the survey that you get at the end of a workshop. And it, there was a question on the bottom, would you be interested in being part of a farmer group? Um, and there was, I don't know, there's, I don't know, 12 farmers or something like that that get together a couple times a year and just bounce crazy ideas off of each other. Um, so we're actually pretty lucky that um, we're not the, I mean, I'm not the only guy in Divide County that does things outside of the box. And I have, there's other guys around to bounce ideas off of. I'll just put this uh, little plug in here. Uh, it was last year of uh, winter of 2018. I actually had a neighbor that lives north of me, uh, big into livestock, and he drove past our place and he called me and uh, he said, uh, Tony, I just realized that you have the cleanest snow in the township. Uh, my name is Stefan van Vliet, and I'm from uh, Duke University. I have an interest in, uh, in human nutrition, so it's great to hear from you guys uh, who are actually producing this, uh, the, the, the food in the field and some of your efforts. 
which I think may make the, the food more nutritious. So you talked about soil health for a bit, but I was wondering if you could comment on, if you have your livestock graze cover crops, do you feel that maybe improves the, the health of your livestock and also subsequently the quality of the meat? Can you tell, comment on that? Does it matter or what, do you, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, so first, uh, when we first started grazing um, cover crops, uh, first it was just after crop grazing, pretty soon it turned to full season grazing. Um, and at the same time we pushed calving back to, um, to May and June. And it's, I don't know which part of that plays the biggest role, but th our cows have never been in better shape. And my mom and my s older sister are both veterinarians, so I do walk a fine battle at home of how much I can, you know, push the cows, whether they're a pet or a combine on four legs. But um, so we, I don't, when I feed the cows, I don't feed them anything spe spectacular. I make sure they're not starving, but I make them do the work. And the cows have never been in better shape, and it, I think I've fed them worse and worse every winter just to see what they can do. On the other hand, when we're selling beef to people in the area, I, I get questions all the time of what are you feeding them? Where does the taste come from? I've never tasted beef like this. And I look at them, I was like, I don't feed them anything special. Like, I don't do anything different than the guy down the street. A lot of times with our seed cleaning business, I'm actually taking junk that most people throw in a pit and let the rats eat. I'm taking that and I'm feeding it to a cow. And if you think about that, you're feeding junk to a cow, you should get junk back. Well, you leave that up to this mysterious cow animal and they turn out this delicious red meat. Um, so that's, I mean, somewhere along the line, I think it does all tie back to soil health. If you um, go to our Facebook page or something, you'll see the plug from Northern Prairie Market that we believe that um, healthy soils lead to healthy plants, healthy plants lead to healthy animals, and ultimately healthy plants and animals will lead to healthy humans. Um, but I don't know, I'm not a scientist, so I can't pinpoint where that starts or ends or where we, how we get there. Yeah, I got a question for both of you, uh, Tony and Morgan. You know, one of the things that, uh, if you look around uh, in the states around us, uh, we're really deficit in livestock in this state. And we've wrestled with this in <clears throat> some of our committees as to how we can increase the number of livestock, because <clears throat> as both of you know, uh, livestock seem to be the key, or will be the key, to certainly making that quantitative jump in terms of soil health. So do, what's, uh, <clears throat> what's the answer, or what's the way that we potentially, what, what do you see as a limiting scenario why we can't get the livestock numbers up in North Dakota? And what things do you think we can do to get that uh, jump started? Uh, I think the biggest, it, at least in our area, if I look across the, the landscape of the producers in our area, um, we, do, we have uh, beef cattle producers, we have mixed producers, and we have crop producers. But the overwhelming majority of them are people that are in their 60s, 70s, about ready to, to quit. And those people they no longer have the energy or anything to bring livestock onto the, onto the place. And it makes no sense for them financially to do that because they're only gonna be around farming for a few more years. So I think the big, there's a huge opportunity um, in North Dakota especially for people who want to um, work with, with crop producers. Um, there's, there's so many opportunities. I know in just our area, um, I like to tell people that my cows are some of the most sought after ladies in the county. Um, I, have, I, I have people all, all the time um, ask if, would you be interested in grazing this or would you be interested in grazing that? And it's gotten to the point where I, I don't have enough cows to, to, to do any more of that. Um, so there's, there's huge opportunity for anybody who likes livestock um, to partner with, with, um, with crop growers. Uh, to be able to to bridge that gap and bring more livestock onto onto the landscape in North Dakota. Yeah, I just had a question for you. I'm a student here at BC, and I'm from uh, southeastern Montana, and uh, we use irrigation pivots. We run about four of them, and our crop varieties are like wheat, alfalfa, and then we try to incorporate some like cover crops like soybeans. Would you recommend like um, a seasonal tilling 
because that's what we do. We use a disc and then like we roll our hair. So I just kind of wondering like, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, nobody's grabbing the microphone for me, so I'll take it. <laughs> um, okay, so your question is about a, a seasonal tilling on your fields. Um, I guess my, my question to you, whenever, whenever I'm talking about practices with farmers, it's usually what is your goal? You know, what, what do you need to accomplish? And is that the tool that's going to help you accomplish a specific goal? And so in your case, do you have a, you know, is that to, to reduce stratification of fertilizer? Or is it, you know, what is, what is the goal on that field? And then, um, you know, with, with anything, you know, if you call it seasonal tillage, um, make sure that you know what that means to you. And that, um, you know, oftentimes if those, if you're no-till and you use a tillage pass to get you, get you by eight feet of frost or something like that, just remember what it is um, so that you don't make it habit. Um, I mean, and that's where hearing the term seasonal tillage might become habit. And I don't know if that's, if, if that's part, if that what fits your goal, then, then that's great. But if it's not what's, what's going to solve your, whatever issue you're trying to solve, then, then just be careful of that to make sure it doesn't become habit. So that's not really an answer, but that's what I would have a conversation with a farmer and... <laughs> You're a farmer, so. Okay, uh, first question for Morgan and Tony. Um, with your intercropping practices, like uh, I know Morgan, you said you do chickpeas and flax. Um, obviously, those are two totally different combine settings. And so how do you kind of compensate for the two? And do you find that you get some unthrashed grain that ultimately gets left in the field? Uh, so for chickpeas and flax, it's it's a little trickier than say like uh, if we talk about peas and canola first, that one's pretty easy. You set your combine, you set your combine for peas and turn down the wind for a canola setting. That's pretty easy. Um, the chickpeas and flax first, you have to make sure that you get seeding seeding rates um, or more importantly, plant establishment in the right ratio, because what you're going to end up doing is using chickpeas as ball bearings going through your combine to thresh the flax. In a typical harvest situation, when you're able to harvest them on time, um, you really end up with, I mean, you don't end up with much loss because if you get to the chickpeas before they get too dry, you don't end up cracking them if you put a little pressure on them going through, going through the combine, and they will thresh the flax quite nicely. In 2019, when we had all the moisture issues at harvest, we didn't get there on time, the chickpeas were soggy. Um, they just split in half, and you ended up with a lot of flax balls. But in a typical situation, it's... Um, it's it, you're able to set the combine, so it works all right. Okay, and then with that, um, how many years have you been doing this? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that intercropping. How many, how many years we've been intercropping? Yeah, um, this will um, two full years. Yeah, two full, two full years. Okay, years. so um, I'm just curious if you know you've seen the benefits from it, obviously, but in say a drier situation where you don't get so much rain, could you see a drawback from that that they actually compete each other for? you know, dominance in the field? In our, in our situation, we've seen them kind of as, um, I say you can't get federal crop insurance, they kind of self-insure each other. Um, we're growing crops that um, they're not, they don't have the same growth habits. You know, if you're growing peas and canola, if you have a wet year, um, you'll probably get more canola. If you have a dry year, the canola is probably not going to do well, very well and you'll get more peas. So, um, there are situations where dry weather, of course, is going to negatively affect um, an intercrop, um, just like it will neg negatively affect a monocrop. Um, but I think we're not, you have to be, it is, selecting the crops is, is very important so that you have crops that kind of, um, they work together instead of against each other when it comes to moisture use. I wonder, I can add to that too. Um, at our Carrington Research Extension Center, Mike Osley has picked up on the intercropping work that was done, started maybe 10 years ago or something, or before that. Uh, Carrington's always had kind of a history of doing really unique projects. So like the intercropping, the 60 inch corn starting this year. Um, so maybe looking back through some of that or through, um, is it turning points or center points, the newsletter that Carrington puts out? Um, or you can get some of that, those, those discussions and information. Um, that may be a place to look, too, to see what, what it looked like in a dry year and what they found um, in their trials, too. Yes, I have a question for 
both Abby and for the producer panel. Um, with your um, program that you have with um, the students coming into the zoos, um, is there a chance that you could expand that out to other communities? Because most of our young people in large cities and metropolitan area don't realize where our food comes from. And I'd like to see more of that, um, especially even within the tribal boundaries, um, because I find it interesting. And my second question is to the two producer panels. Did your f folks have a plan to allow you to come back to the farm to incorporate you into the farming operation? Because I think there is a need for that because most of our young individuals that are coming back to the farms are the ones that want to come back to the farms and have an opportunity to make changes based on what they foresee as an economic, um, being able to make money on the farm. And that's one of the big, I think, downturns is that our young individuals want to be able to make you know, to pay off their college loans, their debts, and those things, but they also want to be able to make money on the farm. And if we can get them to see that, yes, you can make money on the farm, and their parents or their people that are on the farm now can encourage them to come back, I think we will see more uh, people back on the farm. Okay, do you guys have that question locked in your brains? Okay, don't forget it because I'm going to forget my question. Um, so with the, with the Children's Zoo Farm at the Red River Zoo, um, that was kind of a unique situation that came about. Number one, we have, a, very, we have a, a director of the zoo who is very, very open to partnerships and new ideas. And then they had this blank canvas of an empty, modern-looking barn, really terrible crops because they're zookeepers, right? So they were growing corn and sunflower that were knee-high on me, which maybe that's an accomplishment. I don't know. Um, and so it was just this, this opportunity that, that we saw, and then I brought in the, the North Dakota Corn Council and the North Dakota Soybean Council, both sponsored the indoor exhibit, um, and they paid for a profess, professional out of Duluth to design it. Um, I think that could exist other places. I know that on a national level, our director from the Red River Zoo is, um, is very sought after for information on how those partnerships developed and the exhibit that was developed, um, because she basically... I mean, we raised the money, we developed the content, we wrote the content. So as the kids are playing in a, in a combine or climbing up a soil climber, um, the parents, instead of being on their phone looking at Twitter, which is what I usually do, can read you know, information about modern agriculture and, and see actual farmers from our area. Um, so I would love to see it other places. Um, right now, I think you really need somebody in agriculture leading that effort at those zoos. Um, so for example, I go to work all day and then I leave work and I pick up my son and then we go and we, we weed the crops area and we take care of it, we fertilize it and we, we basically plant it. His, his pre-K class planted a lot of the, the crops out there. Um, so the rows were a little <laughs> crooked, but nobody noticed. Um, but I think you need somebody that's involved in agriculture to, to not put more work on the zookeepers or the zoo itself, because most of the zoos are really struggling, honestly. Um, and to, to come in and say, we're going to take care of it, and we're going to do this for you, and it's going to be, um, and we're just, we're just going to do it. So, um, so I, think, I think that opportunity is there. If there's an opportunity like in Bismarck or wherever else, I think some of those zoos could take that on. And now that you guys have both forgotten the second question, does anyone remember and want to answer? Uh, so I was lucky enough that my parents neither neither tried to convince me to come back nor pushed me away. They just, uh, they allowed me to, to um, make that decision for myself. Um, well, actually, when I graduated high school, I told both my parents that I'd never step foot on a farm again. Um, just because at that point in my life, I, I, I always said there's way too many ifs in farming. Like, I, I can't control them, so I'm, I'm not interested in all the ifs. Um, it only took me one semester of college before I decided that maybe it wasn't quite so bad. Um, <laughs> so... And then they, were, then they were more than receptive of me coming back. Um, to the second part of the question about 
Um, how do we show young people that there's money in agriculture? Um, for the first step, in my, my opinion, is that we need to um, show young people that there's more to, more to being involved in agriculture than just being a farmer or a rancher. There's so many more opportunities out there. Um, as you saw on that slide, there's, there's so much money in agriculture these days. Um, and really, uh, by looking at that graph, any young person shouldn't want, want, like they shouldn't be like, oh, the first thing I want to do is be a farmer. Or, the first thing I want to do is shouldn't be a rancher if they're thinking uh, as long as those numbers go. But there's so many ways they can be involved in agriculture and start out somewhere else and then come back um, um, and be a farmer or rancher um, later on if that's how they want to do it. I talk to so many people that think the only way to get involved in agriculture is to, to jump in two feet at one time um, when maybe they shouldn't be doing that and, and, and they don't have the means to do that. I guess the, the story on how I got started with it is uh, uh, we had some good family friends that asked my folks, well, when did Tony know he wanted to farm? And they said, well, when he was five years old. And they said, no, no. Like, when did you know he wanted to come back to the farm and farm? When he was five years old. So I've wanted to do this no matter what. I, I was going to be uh, a farmer. And I picked up my first property when I was uh, 12 years old. I think it was uh, about my first property when I was still in high school. And uh, so I started off trying to pick up my own land and not and, and helping my folks and in return being able to use their equipment to to put a crop on to, to my property and then from there I just I tried to pick up anything that everybody was getting rid of and that meant starting off with absolutely garbage fields there weren't nice fields they weren't big flat square hundred acre fields, it was a 30 here and a 20 here and a 15 over here. So when somebody asked, well, how did it go today? I'm like, well, I did eight fields today. <laughs> well, that was, you know, maybe not even 200 acres. But uh, uh, I think if somebody wants to come back, uh, it, it's very tough for somebody young to come back to the farm if they, if they really wanted to farm. But for the folks to be open to new ideas uh, it's, uh, they've done something, uh, like I'm a fourth generation farmer, and uh, the, what I'm doing now is totally different than uh, what my great grandpa did and my grandpa and my dad, but they were very open to, to the ideas that I had, and there's so much precision that's coming into it now. And I understand that, that uh, the generation has worked their whole entire life, whether they're in their 60s or 70s, uh, and even into the 50s, of trying to get the property and it's so tough to be able to let it go uh, to the next generation. Sometimes it actually ends up skipping a generation. I've got a good family friend that that's how it is. It just, he's not even gonna get the opportunity to even uh, purchase the property. He's hoping that his son will be able to because the family finally got that property and doesn't wanna let it go at all and until they end up passing. But, uh, 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 just try to be open if they come back with new ideas. Take them to meetings. Take them around. Uh, there's just yeah, let them try just a little tiny piece. You know, for example, with the, the no-till and the cover crop. I mean, if they've never done it before, uh, try to get some research on it and uh, you know show that you are trying to improve what you have as a family on your property. And uh, uh, yeah, that that's a really it's a tough tough to get the, any kids to come back. So especially with the, the way the economy is right now, it's, uh, if you've just started out in the last year or two, it's a, it'll be a struggle. Your cafe talk matrix, um, how do you communicate in between cafe talks and how can someone get involved in that? Okay, so you were just at the Jamestown one. I recognize you. Um, yep, Tony was there too. Um, so yeah, talking between the cafe talks. So the best thing to stay in touch between the cafe talks is, is I know I have your email, but to get me your phone number. And, and if I, once I learn more like about your system or, or something like that, then I, I try to connect farmers from totally different areas sometimes, but maybe they have a similar rotation or they have a similar interest in trying cover crops with sunflowers or they have, you know, something in common. And, and that's a really, 
so not that I'm the only connector, but I think, um, I think that there's an opportunity there um, between the cafe talks to be connected on some level. Um, like, so for example, I see Michael out here. I just got an email from somebody in Manitoba whose family is transitioning to no-till and looking for a farmer in the Northern Valley that's, that's doing that. Well, I know Michael and, and he was gracious to pass along his number and, and, um, and help that other, that other family in Manitoba. So, so I guess the best thing is get me your phone number. And then I will always ask before I give your phone number out, I will ask you if it's okay. Um, because I wouldn't appreciate if I had a private number or somebody just giving it out randomly to other people. Um, because I do recognize you guys still have a job to do on the farm and you can't always answer calls too. But, but that, may be, that may be one way, keep going to different meetings. Um, one of the things we're gonna do at the Dirt Workshop this December is we're gonna actually, we're gonna create a more specific network than the one I showed. Because um, we've asked farmers in the past to list three names of other farmers they talk with, three names of ag professionals that they talk with, and then we build a network based off of that. So it's more specific than just a, a place and time. Um, and I wanna do that again at the end of the DIRT workshop because I wanna see what new connections were made at that workshop and how that's carrying forward. So, um, so hopefully that's another opportunity to kind of get involved in a network and share numbers. And I know it's kind of weird too, like, like to go up and ask somebody, hey, can I get your phone number? Because it just sounds weird, you know, but, but it's a good thing to do, right? I mean, because you're going to regret it. And then, you know, it, it's best to just like say, hey, I really, I want to give you a call at some point to find out more about XYZ and get the number and put it in your phone, whether you use it or not, uh, at least you have it. If I remember correctly, you said you can't get insurance when you intercrop. So how do you justify that decision if you have like a drought or a total loss? versus that yield bump that you might get from intercropping? Um, yeah, so go figure the government tells us it's not a good faith effort in growing a, a crop, so they won't insure it. Um, so I guess my answer to that is always I don't farm for crop insurance. Um, if I'm going to, my, a good faith effort to me in farming is to do whatever I can um, to further soil health, to make sure I can do this next year, um, to try to grow a food product that I would want to eat at my own in my own kitchen, um, and I think intercropping is is one way that you can tackle a lot of those a lot of those issues. Um, it's not as a, as I often say, um, we don't really talk about max yield on our on our farm. Actually, if I get a magazine in the mail and it says the biggest word on the cover is magazine or uh, yield, I throw it in the garbage faster than it got in the mailbox. So um, I guess, yeah, you will. Oh, I actually, we had 450 acres of chickpeas and flax this year that we didn't even combine because it wasn't. I mean, there was nothing worthwhile there, and I didn't get an insurance check. Um, but because of the diversity that, w that goes on around our operation, those 450 acres didn't break the farm. Um, we didn't get an insurance check, um, but we, there was a, we had our eggs spread out in enough different baskets that when we collected them all, we still had enough eggs um, to move forward with. Just going off the title, farming and ranching for the bottom line, I don't want to know your specifics, but... If you were to just be a first generation farmer, do you think you could incorporate these things and still be profitable? Or do you think the way the current system is set that just like our first speaker, he promotes regenerative egg, but on his own family farm, they just do corn and soybeans. So I know the realities are you got to pay your bills, but can you just share how uh, profitability has been for you guys and if you think if you were to start from scratch you could still incorporate these things and and make your payments so I don't want to beat a dead horse um, but diversity has allowed um, my brother and I to to implement all of these things on our farm um, we we farm with my dad um, but we farm separately from him. We run our own business, and Dad and Mom have their own business. Um, and we've implemented all of these, all of these things on our farm. Um, so the short answer to your question is yes, it is possible. Um, like Tony said, my parents allowed us to use their equipment um, to put the crop in, um, as we did. You know, shared labor with allowed them to, um, or helped them out on their farm. 
but I think, uh, like I said, diversity, like we started out, Isaac and I, um, in the spring before we had enough land to keep us busy. Isaac was running a, a grain cleaner all spring and I was running a fertilizer spreader all spring. So other people were paying us to farm. So I, I think there's, there's ways to do it. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that too. Uh, like my cover crop mixes that I get into here is, is costing me seven to $10 an acre. I mean, so you can really keep it fairly cheap and uh, I don't do any broadcasting at all. Uh, I always incorporate mine. So whatever the way you're set up for running across with, uh, I just use a dish drill. And because uh, I want to make sure that that um, seed is getting into the soil rather than just broadcasting it. Because I found out with broadcasting it, you need to have it really, really dry. So all the seeds fall in the crack. And then the next day, you need to get a half inch of rain. So, so I, I will run a dish drill across uh, all of our stuff and for, for cover cropping. But uh, what I found out now is this takes out a lot of the peaks and the valleys. Uh, you, you'll have good years, you'll have bad years, but instead of getting this big roller coaster, it, it, it seems like it's a lot more consistent. And obviously Morgan's the same way as us. We've, we've been in it for a few years and it, it seems like, you know, to get the system working, but uh, I could see how that would uh, deter a lot of people from doing it. You know, you're trying to cut every cost that you can. So, I mean, if you could save, you know, 10 to 20 bucks an acre, you know, would, would you do it? But, but then you look at all the other benefits that come with it too. I mean, you can't put a dollar amount on how much moisture you can save. You can't put a dollar amount on a field that doesn't blow. You can't put a dollar amount on uh, one that doesn't wash. Uh, to all those little tiny things, it's, it's so tough to put a dollar amount on what you're actually getting. And that's the question that I get from everybody is, okay, if I do this, how am I going to see a, uh, what kind of dollar amount am I going to see? And, and that's, everybody's looking at, uh, I want it like right now, if I put a cover crop in, and we just had this discussion at the table, if I put a cover crop in, I want to have no chemicals to be spraying on it. I don't want to have to put any fertilizer down. I want to get another 80 bushel on top of my crop already, <laughs> and I want it to harvest itself. It just doesn't work like that. But that's what a lot of people will see. I mean, this, it just takes time. But what I've noticed, to, just to, to wrap it up, it, it takes out the peaks and the valleys. Okay, I think that's the end. <laughs>